you. Uh, first off, um, so I woke up this morning and I thought perhaps um, I could try to give this talk in Portuguese. Uh, I'm not quite ready, but I have found uh, the Python community here in South America and in Brazil to be incredibly warm and welcoming and inclusive. This is my second conference here in Brazil, so I promise to be back uh, another day and I will try then. Um, so my talk today is about Bokeh. Um, who here has used Bokeh? A few folks? Okay, great. That will be good. Also, if anything's confusing, uh, please just raise your hand and let me know. I'll try to, to explain. Uh, okay, so the talk today is just um, really about what's going on with Bokeh. Um, what is the current status? What are some examples that I want to show? Uh, what are the plans for the future? So if you aren't familiar with Bokeh, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, Bokeh is a library for data visualization uh, in Python. Um, and that includes things like widgets, that includes things like interactive tools for uh, you know, using the plots. Um, we also tried to make it very versatile. Uh, so you can make very uh, novel uh, graphics or um, very specialized graphics if you have interesting data that, you know, that, that would be useful for. And we also wanted to make it useful for streaming and dynamic data. Uh, and also for the large data case. And I'll talk about some of that in just a bit. Um, mostly though, uh, we wanted to make it for the browser. So a little bit of my history, um, I've been interested in visualization uh, for almost 20 years now. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the very first thing I think I saw in the late 90s was some mod Python script for Apache that could take uh, little very small data sets and create like bar charts, just PNGs of, of bar charts or pie charts. And I thought this was amazing, that you could work in the browser and just be able to have visualizations like that. And I thought it was cool. And that sort of sparked my interest in visualization. Uh, later on, I made a few small contributions to VTK, which is another library for 3D visualization. It's a very large C++ library. Uh, and then later on again, I worked with Peter Wang on a library called Chaco. And Chaco is a library for uh, interactive visualization uh, in Python but it's really geared towards uh, rich clients, so Python programs, not necessarily in the browser. Uh, fast forward a few more years, Peter and I uh, started talking about Bokeh, uh, and we realized that you know, the future is really web-based uh, applications in the browser, and so we wanted to be able to create a library that was, you know, use the browser as a first-class uh, concern. So that's, that's sort of the genesis of Bokeh. Um, but none of us like to write JavaScript, I think. <laughs> Is it maybe safe to say? And so the last thing about Bokeh is that there's no JavaScript required. I'll repeat that, no JavaScript required. Um, so you can go to uh, bokeh.idev.org and see the latest documentation. Um, and by the way, if anyone's interested in ever helping to make translations, I would love to uh, have many translations of our documentation. Uh, I think we have set up the infrastructure and some of the, you know, sort of the, the nuts and bolts to have localization, but uh, we just need help with translation. So if anyone's interested, please please contact us. Okay, so that's sort of what Bokeh is. Um, maybe a little bit about sort of the current status and where things are at with the library, and then we'll move on to some demos, some examples. So what's currently new? So currently new uh, are new annotation types. Some simple things like spans or uh, rectangular regions or annotations, polygonal regions. Also, it's very easy to now give a hover policy. So if you hover over some glyph in a plot, you can make the, the visual appearance change very easily. That used to be a little bit sort of tedious and problematic, and, and now it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we also added the ability to customize and extend Bokeh, and this I think is an actual uh, very important feature. It's something I'm very excited about um, because it allows people to do things that we may not have time to do or may not uh, want to put directly in the library. It really opens up Bokeh, I think, as a platform. Uh, for users to extend and customize on their own, and we'll show some of that in a bit as well. Uh, we've done a lot of code cleanup and refactoring. We're still in the process of cleaning up the code, uh, but we've expanded our testing, so we use Travis CI for all of our uh, continuous integration testing, and we test on Python 2.7 and 3.4 and 3.5, and we're continually improving that and increasing our testing, uh, but it's certainly come a long way in the last year, and, and that's given us a lot more confidence in our releases. We've also added some WebGL support. So Bokeh by itself is based on the HTML5 canvas, and it can easily handle you know, thousands or even tens of thousands of points. Once you start getting into larger data sets with maybe 100,000 points, uh, you, know, you, you need to sort of 
rethink how you're doing things. And so we've added some support for WebGL for markers and lines. And so you can definitely show data sets with you know, uh, larger amounts. And we'll get to some even other topics for, for even larger data sets in a bit. Uh, we also added some new GIS support, things like some preliminary GeoJSON support and a, a tile renderer. So if you want to load a tiled map from OpenStreetMaps or from some other tile provider, the Stamen tile sets, um, you can load those very easily. Uh, we also stabilized the charts API. So Bokeh has uh, a notion of different levels of sophistication or different levels of complexity. There's a very low level API called Bokeh.models where you can put all the building blocks together yourself. It's very powerful, but it's also very verbose, kind of tedious. Uh, there's sort of a middle Bokeh.plotting API that's uh, roughly the same level of verbosity as Matplotlib or Matlab. Um, you specify the kind of shapes that you want and you attach data to the attributes of those shapes. And then there's a very high level API called Bokeh.charts. And the idea here is to be able to have very common statistical charts uh, just in a canned format, very easy. You can create them with a single line of code. Um, but this is the newest API in Bokeh. And we spent some time experimenting a little bit. Uh, and so it wasn't really stable. But we've finally gotten to a point where we have an API that we like, uh, that we are comfortable with, that we can move forward with. And so I think it's reached a very uh, good point of stability. And we now want to go ahead and add more charts. And we've seen some new charts added recently. Uh, I think a chord chart was the last chart that was added. And then finally, uh, we had a notion of a custom JS callback that you could add to do all kinds of specialized interactions. So you could write just a little bit of JavaScript code and make your plots and your visualizations very interactive. Uh, but you had to write that little bit of JavaScript code. Now, actually, thanks to uh, Omar Klein, who works on BizPy, uh, and the Flex project, we have a, basically the ability to compile uh, Python into JavaScript automatically. And so you can write these little uh, callbacks in Python, and they'll get compiled to JavaScript for you, which I think is pretty fantastic. Um, eventually, everything is going to be compiled to JavaScript, I guess. <laughs> the, world of, the world that we're headed toward is, uh, is the browser, is your OS, uh, or something. OK. So a couple other features, though, um, the really important ones. There's two big, big, big changes that, or features that I want to mention. One is that there's a new Bokeh server. So if, if you have been following Bokeh for a while, you may know that uh, in the past there was a um, notion of a Bokeh server. And the first iteration of the Bokeh server, I would say, was not especially successful. Um, we learned a lot from it. Uh, but some of the ideas about how to implement that didn't really pan out. But we have worked really hard, and we made a new server which is much, much better in basically any category that I can think. It's, um, it's faster, it's more robust, uh, it's easier to use. It's based on Tornado. Uh, it uses a WebSocket protocol, so it's very efficient in connecting to the client. Uh, it's definitely easier to use and to deploy. Uh, you just write a simple script. There's no special classes or frameworks that you have to plug into. You just you write a very simple script, and we'll see some examples in a few minutes. Uh, it's very easy. Um, there's a lot more user guide documentation. The old server didn't have nearly enough documentation, partly because we weren't sure we wanted to keep it. But uh, the, new, the new server is fantastic, and we've got a lot of documentation, and we're continually adding more as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's some posted examples you can go see uh, at demo.bokehplots.com. And you can actually see some of these Bokeh applications uh, running live uh, on a deployed site. And there's a lot of information uh, on the user's guide about how you could deploy a site like that yourself if you wanted to. Uh, and I'll show some examples here in a bit. And then the other new uh, sort of important feature that I wanted to mention is actually a separate project uh, called Data Shader. Uh, it's under the Bokeh organization on GitHub, uh, but it, it's a, a separate project that sort of alongside Bokeh. Uh, again, it's under the Bokeh organization. And the intent of Data Shader is to help when you have millions or tens of millions or hundreds or possibly billions of points, you know, what can you do to deal with that? There are a lot of problems inherent with data at that scale. Um, the first of which is, of course, you just can't send 100 million points into your browser. If you tried to do that, it would be a very, very exciting day for your browser. Um, but even if, you could, even if you could send 100 million points to your browser, um, that's not actually the real problem. It's not a technical problem. It's a visualization problem because once you do that, you have things like overplotting or underplotting. or you know, you, you, it's, it's a visualization problem in that you, you want to make sure that the data is presented accurately and faithfully and honestly, uh, and if you just 
throw 100 million points at the screen. You don't have that many pixels, so you're losing information. So what can you do? So Data Shader is an attempt to help provide some tools to deal with that situation. Uh, it's also essentially a, a, a query system. It's sort of, you can think of writing visual queries against these large sets of data, and you can extract the details that you want. And also, again, show some examples of that in a bit. Uh, there is a webinar that's available. Uh, if you wanted to check it out, it's at go.continuum.io slash data shader. There is a little form to fill out, and then uh, it's a free download. You can download the slides and download all of the, uh, the video for the webinar. It's uh, given by uh, Peter Wang, uh, one of the co-founders of Continuum, as well as uh, Jim Bednar, who is the lead um, developer of DataViews. He's also uh, the lead for Holoviews, if you've heard of the Holoviews project, which is really fantastic. Uh, he and his team work on Holoviews uh, and Data Shader. So just a little bit about the history of Bokeh. Um, this is pretty amazing to me. So this is a, some statistics I showed maybe two years ago. I gave a talk at SciPy in Austin, and it was version 0 0.5. You can see we had, you know, a number of stars and forks on GitHub, and I, I think you can't see it very well, but about 5,000 downloads a month reported between Conda and PyPy. That to me was incredible and amazing. Um, and the next year, it was even more so. Can't really see it there. I think it's about 30k downloads a month, and there's more stars, of course. And, and this year, this is sort of from earlier this week, with the latest version 0.11.1, we have you know, like 4,200 stars on GitHub almost, and uh, nearly 50k downloads a month. And, and those numbers, I'm sure, are inflated by people using Conda to install on continuous integration systems, so Travis CI, for instance. But even still, it's, it's a huge growth. And, uh, I'm very humbled by the interest in Bokeh. Um, you know, Bokeh to me, I'm very grateful to be able to work on it. It's sort of a, a life's work for me. And, and so all of this interest is, is incredibly uh, humbling for me. Uh, we also added a new Gitter channel, by the way. If you want to come interact with us and, and ask questions or get involved with development, the Gitter channel is a really nice place to, uh, to get involved. Uh, of course, all this isn't possible without um, a really a team effort. So there's a lot of people that work on and off on Bokeh. There's not a lot of people working full-time on Bokeh, but there's a lot of people who have contributed um, pieces here and pieces there. Uh, Damian Avila, who you may know from the Jupyter Project, uh, has worked extensively on our um, build automation and on our uh, testing systems. And, and uh, he actually gave a talk at SciPy in Austin last year, which was amazing. Uh, there were a few talks, people talking about automating their build process and release process. And, and one talk was talking about, I think, uh, having their releases, they're able to turn them around in a week. Uh, Damian, during his talk, kicked off a bouquet build in the talk, and it was done at the end of the talk, which is incredible, a testament to what he's done. Uh, Havoc Pennington, uh, who you may know from the GNOME project or the GTK project, uh, he worked extensively on the bouquet server. Uh, and the reason the new server is fantastic is because of the hard work that he's, uh, he's put in. Uh, the uh, incomparable uh, Sarah Burr uh, has done just amazing work towards making bouquet more responsive and more, more webby, um, and, and just paying attention to the visual details and the styling and a lot of other folks as well. So uh, all of that's you know, needed. But not just these folks at Continuum, there's a lot of people uh, contributing from outside on GitHub as well. Like this, this is the number from the other day, is 152 contributors, which is amazing to me. I cannot believe that. I'm, again, very humbled by that number. Um, you know, a lot of those contributions are fairly small pull requests. I appreciate every pull request that comes in, and I always try to help anyone that wants to put in that effort to help the project. But I did want to do a special thanks to a few people because we do have a few people now making even larger contributions, right? Um, sort of substantial pull requests are really important to really big features, and it's just incredible to see that. Um, always happy to, to sort of add people to the Bokeh core uh, team on GitHub once they start making contributions like that. Uh, and last but not least, you know, the community is definitely growing. If you go to Stack Overflow or to the mailing list or the Gitter channel, you'll see a lot of activity. Um, and not only that, you'll see a lot of other users answering other users' questions. And so that, to me, is a real sign of growth and a real sign of sort of the community growing up. And I'm just I'm really grateful to see that kind of activity. OK, so maybe a few examples, um, if I can do some of this. So the first thing is I wanted to show off some examples of the Bokeh server. Um, as I mentioned, you can go to demo.bokehplots.com, and you can see some there. But I thought I'd run a few here uh, just locally, and we could take a look. So using the Bokeh server um, is really quite straightforward. Let me actually show some code first. I'll go to, so 
Safari, uh, I want to show the sliders example first, and then I'll show a few other examples. Um, that's pretty small. Make the font bigger. So just a simple Python script. Some comments at the top. Some imports. That's great. Um, we set up some data with NumPy. In this case, we're just making a, a sort of a sine curve, very sort of straightforward. Um, we have two lines for a plot. We create a figure. We put a line in it with the data. No problem. We want to have a couple of widgets to be able to control the aspects of this sine curve, things like the frequency, or the amplitude, or the phase um, uh, offset vertically. Um, so we just add a single line for every widget. So we create a text input, or we create a slider. Very straightforward. And then we can add a callback for these widgets. And if the widget changes, we can do something like change the amplitude, uh, and we can recompute the curve, and we can set the data. Just a few lines of Python code here. Uh, and then we put it all in the layout, and we're done. And so if we go now to the command line, and I want to go to Apps here, go to the right. There we go. So if I if I go here and I run bokeh serve um, sliders .py, and the dash dash show just opens up a browser automatically, then sure enough, I get this little application that shows up, and I can you know change the offset slider, I can change the amplitude slider, I can change the phase, all you know, all that change frequency if I if I type you know my first sine wave. At sci-fi, I can type sci-fi Latin America, uh, and turn off the title changes. And so we can have these little simple applications. So this is a web application that's responsive that has you know widgets that can call out to real Python code. You know you could imagine calling out to Scikit Image or Scikit Learn or Pandas or looking things up in a, data, in a database with the Python code. But I've done that in about. 40 lines of Python code, right? And it's this deployed web application. So we're trying to get out of your way. And if you're already familiar and productive in Python, we want to let you stay in Python and create these interactive sort of data applications. OK, maybe another couple of examples right quick. What is that one? Um, let's see. Let's take a look at a few more. Um, this clustering one's pretty nice. So this is one that actually does use uh, scikit-learn, I believe. So here we have just a, a sample data set, and we can change the number of samples we want. We can say, hey, I want to see a few different numbers of clusters. Uh, maybe I want to see a different data set. In this case, I want to see the noisy moons. Uh, or maybe I want to see the blobs data set. And maybe I want to try different algorithms for clustering. And so this little app has been built to, to expose different clustering algorithms so we can check all of those out. And again, this is, in this case, a bit more Python code, but it's actually all scikit-learn code to, to use the different algorithms. The, the code to set up this application is, is very few lines, you know, 10 or 15 lines of code. OK, another one. Let's take, uh, take a quick look at just a couple more. Um, that's another good one. Uh, let's see, weather. It's good. And stocks is pretty good. You can actually run more than one at once. No reason we can't do that. Oh, and movies, of course, fine. Show all three of these. So the weather one is just a simple one. It shows uh, different weather. Well, let's go to the one that I want. The weather one shows this different weather data over the past few years, and we can you know we can pick a couple of different cities, and maybe we want to see a, a smoothing of this distribution. And so again, all of this is, is very easy to do. The code for this is comparable to that sliders app that I showed you. Uh, another one is the stocks example here. We can show interactions related to you know selection. So if I select points here, I can see the link selection of the plots below. Um, see things like link panning. If I pan this plot, the one below pans as well. Um, the widgets up here allow me to select different data sets, and we can see the summary statistics change. Um, there's just a pan summary function that's called to fill this text box, and it's, it's very easy to sort of push into the bokeh server. And then finally, this is kind of a reproduction of an existing example. You may have seen it. Um, I think there's an R shiny example that's very similar to this for movies. It's just sort of a cross filter for query like. Uh, for the movie, the IMDb movie uh, database, and so you can say, oh, I want to see all the movies that were released between you know, 19, uh, 2000 and, and, and you know, 2014, and I, I want to see the ones that are you know, only uh, animation films or you know, all films, or how many dollars did they make in the box office? And I think this is a really nice example, actually, for comparing. Um, you know, if you go to the deployed shiny version of this, I, I find it to be uh, less responsive than this Bokeh server version. Uh, we've been very careful to try to make the Bokeh server very efficient with the WebSocket protocol. Uh, and there's still things that we can do and are going to do to make it even more efficient. So I'm very excited to be in that position. OK, so that's some examples of uh, the Bokeh server. Um, just a few words about it. Uh, again, we want to let you sort of be able to concentrate on your work and get out of your way. 
Uh, all of those are written in pure Python. Uh, there was no HTML, HTML or CSS, or web app code that you had to write. Now, if you want to get down to those details uh, and you want to be able to do sort of very sophisticated customizations, you, you can get to that level. It's possible to use those things, but you don't have to to get basic applications out. Again, there's no special classes, no frameworks. It's just a simple Python script that uses things like NumPy or SciPy or Pandas, uh, creates some few plots with standard bokeh uh, plotting tools, uh, and is ready to go. Uh, it's very useful for exploratory data analysis. You can use it locally on your own machine to create uh, you know, little applications for exploring data. You can send those to your colleagues, and they can run them uh, very easily. Uh, but it's also possible to deploy these on larger sites, and we have extensive documentation on how you want to do that. So if you want to be able to serve these applications to uh, 100 users or 1,000 or tens of thousands of users, that's a little bit more of a deployment, and then we have instructions on how to do that kind of deployment. Uh, and all of the things that I showed here just now, uh, only these out of the box features of Bokeh 0.11.1. That's the latest release. Uh, upcoming very soon is Bokeh 0.12, and I'm going to talk about what's coming up in 0.12 in just a bit. Okay, maybe some more examples. Um, another thing that was added for Bokeh server is a streaming API, and this is pretty exciting. There's a nice YouTube video here that's about the streaming API in general. You can go check that out. Let me go ahead and run this example locally. So here if I go, and we'll take a look at the code. If I go and I run okay, serve and I run OHLC, so OHLC stands for Open, High, Low, Close, and it's basically an abbreviation for market data. So we have some simulated prices from the market uh, that are being generated continuously, uh, and then we're updating this plot, and you can see it's got uh, the bars show what the opening and the, and the low and the, and the high and the close prices were. There's a moving average that traces through it. There's also this other indicator, it's called a MACD, indicator, I think, at the bottom. Um, and you know you can move around. Uh, you can tell if you want to reset. And we'll start following again. Maybe you want to change the parameters of the simulation. I want the mean to be you know, very very large. And you know we'll start making a lot of money here pretty soon. Look at that. I'm sure we could do that in real life, right? That would be nice. Um, we can make it more volatile by changing the standard deviation. Uh, you know, we can change the moving average. Maybe we want an exponentially weighted moving average. And so we can certainly change to that. So again, we have this nice streaming app, and, and the streaming API makes it efficient to update. If we had to send all of the data all the time on every update, that's not very efficient. So the streaming API lets you do incremental updates. And let's take a look maybe at the code. I don't know, are there any guesses on how many lines of code uh, a web application with streaming tick data, uh, including, including the simulation, how many lines of code that would take? Any guesses? People always undercut me. They always say like 10. <laughs> it is more than 10 lines, but let's take a look at that demo and, and see how much it is. Uh, it's definitely under, um, it's under 100 lines of code, right? Which I think it's pretty amazing. So again, there's some imports. Uh, we create some plots here, uh, a whole lot of lines of code to create our plots. Uh, we've got some, the simulation code is actually, the, the bulk of this data is actually to, to do the, or code, the bulk of this code is to create the simulated data, because that's actually part of the script as well. And then we have an update function, and the key is this line at the bottom, we create a dictionary that has the new data for every column, and then we call this dot stream. Make that bigger. We call this dot stream method, uh, and we tell it how many points we want to keep total, uh, and it just sends just the newest data. So it's very efficient. So it only sends, you know, in this case, it sends maybe ten numbers at a time to your browser, and so it's much more uh, efficient and able to keep up with fairly uh, fast update rates. Okay. So that's the, the streaming API. mentioned, uh, you know, the last example is under 100 lines of code, including the simulation, right? Most of it was the simulation, actually. Um, only since the latest data points, and we have more uh, features and enhancements planned. One of the things we'd like to do is um, actually move to a binary array protocol. Right now, we basically convert everything to JSON to send it over the WebSocket, but there are definitely some things we can do with um, binary WebSocket uh, messages to make things even faster and more performant, and we want to do that uh, in the near future. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit, a bit about um, the custom models and extensions. So uh, I'm really excited about this. Right? It's basically the idea is that you can write, you know, if there's some cool JavaScript library that does something awesome or amazing that you want to be able to interact with from Python in a web application, you can extend Bokeh to do that. So this is an example of, uh, of that. So people ask about 3D and Bokeh a lot, and someday we might get around to 
adding something directly to the library, but I guess the main point is that you don't have to wait. <laughs> you don't have to wait on us, right? Um, we can also Surface 3D, and right, and so now this is sending data from the Bokeh server uh, and updating this plot because I've wrapped this JavaScript library is.js um, and I've adapted it to be able to use from Bokeh. Now, I'll lie a little bit, this requires a feature that's in Bokeh 012, so I'm a little bit ahead of the game here, but um, not too far, hopefully. So what does that look like? Actually make these custom models. Let's take a quick look at the code. If we look at this Python file, it's almost nothing, right? Um, it's basically uh, some options here at the bottom. A couple of attributes, we want to send x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, we want to send a data source, a column data source. Uh, we want to send a few other attributes. And then there's this JavaScript implementation. Uh, and what does that look like? So if we take a look at the JavaScript file, it's also very short, right? So there are the options, just a big uh, object or dictionary of options. There's a little bit of code here to adapt the Python data source to this graph 3D JavaScript library. And that's what this set data function does. Uh, and then we just reiterate, here are the properties that we had on our object, and that's it. Right? So that's all the code it took for me to be able to manipulate it and power this 3D JavaScript library from Python from the Bokeh server. So really excited about um, the Bokeh server for a couple of different reasons. Uh, um, you know, the, the ability to sort of extend Bokeh in this way I think is really fantastic because really it, it lowers the barrier to entry. So um, it's a lot easier to get involved in Bokeh development today than it was a few years ago. Um, we have a lot more documentation, we've streamlined the process for getting everything built and having a development environment, but it's still a, a barrier to want to check out something in GitHub and, and really get you know, down into the details. Um, this allows anyone to immediately extend Bokeh using whatever they happen to have installed without having to get GitHub and try out all kinds of new ideas. And I think that's really fantastic. Um, and you don't have to wait on us, right? The idea is that if there's something cool that you need, you know, it may take the the core team a long time to get around to it just because of you know, the amount of resources that we have. It may be that it's not even appropriate to put in the main library, but that doesn't matter. You can sort of scratch your own itch, so to speak, and you can you can uh, add things without having to wait for us, which I think is fantastic. Eventually, what I would love to see is an Atom style repository. So if you're familiar with the Atom editor, there's tons of user extensions for the Atom editor. And I think you can open up a little page that shows a directory listing of all these different extensions, uh, and you can just install them, and, and they're ready to go and add it to sort of enhance by that. I would love to have a, a OK extensions command. Fires up a web page that shows a lot of extensions that any, you know, any users can contribute. Uh, and then you can install those and, and make them available. So that's, my, that's sort of my vision for where I'd love to see things go. Um, not quite there yet, but I'm hoping in the near future we'll have something like that. OK. Um, last demo here is uh, for data shader. Uh, you do have billions and billions of, uh, of points. And interestingly enough, I actually have a copy of a book called Billioise et Billioise. It's a, a Portuguese translation of a book by Carl Sagan. And he likes to point out at the beginning, he never actually said billions and billions, apparently. Uh, so that's what he claims. Anyway, so what do you do when you have these billions of points? Um, well, like I said, it's, it's not really a technical problem. Even if you could send all the data into your browser or into, uh, into a plot of any kind, uh, just doing that leads to all kinds of visual problems of overplotting and, and you just don't have the ability to see your data. So what can you do about that? So Data Shader, very quickly, uh, has a couple of facilities for dealing with larger data sets. So let's take a look at this first one. Uh, so this is a million points we create here. By the way, Jim, Jim Bednar created this notebook. He creates really great detailed sort of walkthrough style notebooks. So I encourage you to check these out. These are all in the Data Shader repository in the examples repository or example directory. So he creates a million points. Um, what does it look like? It looks like uh, sort of this, uh, this line tracing around. But if we zoom in, we see that there's actually more detail. There's actually this wiggle. The line has this wiggle all throughout. And then if we zoom in even further, we see there's actually sort of this jitter, this error at a very fine scale. So what, you know, is there a way that we can sort of be able to cut across scales interactively uh, and look at this data? And sure enough, uh, Data Shader allows you to do this sort of thing. And so here we have the data, if I can zoom in, Sure enough, we can see the progressive refinement happen sort of immediately on this, this million data points. I can keep zooming in, and I can start to see that really fine level of detail. This is just an integration of Bokeh uh, and Data Shader together. As I mentioned, Data Shader is a separate project, but it's, uh, it's very flexible 
sort of pipeline for visual queries on large data sets, and it integrates very well with Bokeh, so we can have this ability to zoom in and out and have progressive refinement. Uh, another example here is using time series. This, again, I think is about uh, a million or two million points, and there's a couple of uh, special time series buried in here. One has no noise, and one has sort of a different signal altogether, and the question is, how can we see that, or how can we discern that? If you just plot all the data, you can't see anything. Uh, so you say, well, maybe I want to plot the data sets with different colors. But that doesn't really help either because it, it matters now what order you plot things in. They plot on top of one another and that detail is lost. So data share lets you think by saying, I want to interpolate between different uh, qualities of the data and data share can do that automatically. And now very easily you can see where this one signal starts to diverge. Um, again, we have this ability as well to have this progressive refinement. If we actually zoom in down here on the axis, we can start to see the actual data uh, refine, we can start to see the actual details you know, in real time. Uh, <clears throat> there we go, so we can see more detail there. So the last thing is uh, the New York City taxi data set here. This is uh, now uh, 12 million data points, I believe. Um, is that right? I think it might actually be more. Anyway, um, what do we do with that, right? So it's, it's a data about taxis, pick up locations, drop off locations, times, uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, if we just plot a subset of it, we can sort of make out there's Manhattan. Manhattan exists. Congratulations, we've discovered Manhattan. Uh, same thing here with more. We just, we don't get much information out of it. Um, if you just plot everything, you know, you, you don't really get much sense there either. So what can we do? Well, again, Data Shader provides uh, the ability to sort of visually query this data. And in particular, you can say things like, I want to show where the drop off, wherever there's more drop offs than pickups, I want that to be colored uh, blue. And wherever there's more pickups than drop offs, I want that to be colored pink. And you can see very clearly the structure in the data that there are more people picked up on the vertical large avenues and there's more people dropped off on the side streets. And that's not too surprising. But from that, we could maybe extrapolate and say, well, this correlates to the structure of this very gridded Manhattan layout. What about other places like Brooklyn where it doesn't have this grid layout? We can now sort of see exactly, you know, this must be a major street in Brooklyn. There's a lot of pickups on this major streets, and there's uh, this one as well. But additionally, it works with this progressive refinement. You can zoom in. So it's interesting to me if you zoom in here on the west coast of Manhattan, there is a large convention center. That's not it, actually. Uh, let me find it. It's called the Javits Center. It's a very large convention center. And I just love that you can see really interesting details in the data. Ah, uh, there it is. Uh, in front of the Javits Center, there's this circular, circular parking lot. And you can see exactly which way the direction of traffic flows because you can see the cabs come in, they drop people off, and then immediately they pick people up and start circling back around. You can see exactly where that happens in the data. Uh, there's all kinds of details, you know, as you get down to the level of individual sort of measurements here, you can really see the individual data points pop out. Uh, another interesting location is uh, is over here in the Guardia. By the way, this is happening on my laptop right now. So again, this is, I think, 12 million data points, and I'm sort of interactively you know, dealing and, and manipulating these 12 million points and zooming in and out on my laptop, and it's, it's really not an issue at all. So here we go. Yeah, so here's the Guardia. You can really see the structure here. You can see exactly where the pickup lanes and drop-off lanes of the Guardia are. Um, I think it's interesting that the, the red areas are sort of smeared out. I believe this is because they're actually under, under not underground, but they're the lower level, and that the GPS signal is attenuated by the, the concrete on top. But it's interesting, you can see all of that sort of very, uh, you know, very detailed structure by being able to go across scales. Okay, so that's data shipper. It integrates very well with, uh, with Bokeh. Okay. So, again, it's sort of a pipeline for visual queries. Um, you know, we want to be able to interact with things in the browser. Um, you know, it said it's not possible to send all the data, so how can we deal with that? And, and data shader lets us do that without down, down sampling. It does some really interesting um, equalization of histograms or other kinds of uh, more visually appropriate transformations to map bins of data together. It's powered by Dask and Numba, two of those other open source projects. Uh, you know, Numba is the compiler for Python. Dask allows us to distribute the computations. A lot of the computations for Data Shader are very parallelizable, which is nice. Um, in particular, uh, Jim also did as a benchmark, he did the complete open street map uh, data set, which is 3 billion points. He did it on a large AWS instance that could fit the entire data set in RAM. And using DAS and Numba, it completed in, I think, eight seconds, right? So that's um, pretty good for 3 billion points. Um, speaking of DAS, um, Matt Rockland has actually written a really great utility for performance measurement, performance monitoring for DAS using Bokeh Server. 
Um, so, you know, he uh, wrote this. It took him, he was never, not very familiar with Bokeh. He'd never used the Bokeh server, but he wrote this in a pretty short amount of time, and it shows CPU and memory and communications use on a cluster over time. Um, his quote from him, Matt Rothman, is that it's been invaluable for understanding the performance characteristics of distributed computations. Uh, and it's just, it's, he didn't need to go out and, and find a web developer or, or to use uh, you know, sort of web tech technology. He could just write a simple Python script, you know, familiar sort of thing, uh, and have this, you know, this running uh, server. So I don't have a demo of that running, uh, but you can go to the Dask documentation and find out more. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is that Bokeh is not just for Python. Um, you know, uh, really, there's an R Bokeh project uh, that's actually maintained by someone else, uh, Ryan Hafen. Uh, he's a big R fan, he's a big Bokeh fan. He decided to write Python bindings for Bokeh. And so if you go to uh, his website, you can actually see a lot of examples of R code creating Bokeh plots. And these are standard Bokeh plots with all the standard tools that you would have. Um, and they're created with, with R code. And so that's what good. There's also uh, Bokeh.scala is available. Uh, and uh, there's an old Julia binding. Um, if you're interested in Julia and you know about Julia, um, would love to try to get someone interested in being a new maintainer. Uh, the old maintainers don't really have time to keep up with it, but um, uh, we'd love to see that move forward. So I think I'm actually running short on time. Let me quickly go through what's upcoming uh, in the next version here as well. We're adding new annotations, things like arrows, labels, finally a color bar, <laughs> uh, way overdue. Uh, some improvements to legend and hover tools. Basically, uh, if you have lots of different points and you have a lot of different points that are hit under your mouse, you want to make sure that that is better. Um, there's a new core chart that was added. There's a new JavaScript, TypeScript API, right? So you can actually use BokehJS directly and create charts like this from JavaScript. So if you need a JavaScript letter for charting, you can use Bokeh directly. <coughs> there are some more examples. So this is, a, this is all of this code was what generated this. So this very tiny amount of JavaScript code uh, created all of these charts. Um, adding uh, foundational layout improvements that works going on right now. We're trying to make the automatic layout much, much better, much more sort of attractive and responsive, um, as well as adding um, custom server templates. If you want to serve single page applications that very heavily involve Bokeh, um, you can do that directly from the Bokeh server, not have to embed the, the server anymore. Uh, that'll be great. Um, computed columns for data sources, so adding things like jitter. Uh, or step functions or things like that to data will be much easier. You don't have to do it in Python. You can just say, hey, I want to add jitter to the x value, and you can have the, the data jitter. A lot of bug fixes. And then um, 1.0 very soon, right? So the main thing we want to provide is um, stability, API guarantees, so semantic versioning. Um, that's going to entail adding a lot of new tests to our continuous integration. To, to confidently support semantic version, we want to make those guarantees. There's a lot of APIs that have already been stable for some time in Bokeh, and we just want to make, you know, make that public guarantee that they won't change. Do we also want to do a, a visual improvement? Um, and we're also working towards project governance, right? So uh, the Bokeh enhancement proposal, uh, we call them beeps. <laughs> you ever hear them? Uh, we've started one, it, it has a long way to go to, to flesh out, but we want to make sure that there's public uh, governance documents um, and the target for the one point release is July. It may slip a little bit, but that's definitely our, our goal is to have that out by July or so. so what after that? Um, one of the reasons for the governance is because we want to become a known focus fiscally sponsored project. Uh, probably not this year, but in early 2017. Uh, so a lot of projects like Pandas and, and others uh, are known focus sponsored projects and we would like to join, join that. Um, things like LaTeX labels and, and graphs, you know, we're definitely not done with 1.0. There's still more to do. Um, animations and transitions, we want to add uh, a develop mode. We'll sort of create bokeh plots interactively and edit things interactively in the browser. Uh, and finally, SVG output. We're actually pretty close to this, I think. We have a, we have a proof of concept, but we need to go back and, and try out some other things. So anyway, um, try out bokeh and data shader, both uh, BSD licensed, everything, the server, the JavaScript. Uh, it's available on GitHub. Check it out, and that's my talk.
when you have uh, the book in a uh, Jupyter notebook visualization, uh, if you export the notebook, uh, what is the result of? question uh, about using bokeh in the notebook. Um, I forgot to mention actually we added a new push notebook function that lets you have animations in the notebook very easily. Um, that depends. So if you use something like NVViewer to export the notebook and it includes all the JavaScript, it works great. Um, there are some sites uh, that when they display notebooks they scrub and remove any JavaScript, like GitHub for instance, and we have no control over that. So notebooks on GitHub uh, that have bokeh plots they will not render on GitHub because GitHub won't run the JavaScript. And, and I understand, for security reasons, they won't run JavaScript, but um, that does mean that in situations like that it won't work. But if someone looks at the, the notebook locally, the, the, the exported notebook locally, everything should work fine. Um, that's good. That's a good question. Other questions? Uh, you mentioned type rendering. What's behind that? Uh, so yeah, so the question was about tile rendering and what's behind that. Um, no, it's not leaflet, but it could be. So using a, a custom user extension model, um, it would be really easy to wrap leaflet. I would love to see that happen. Um, right now, we wrote a very simple tile render of our own that can connect to a wide variety of tile sources. So the examples we have, for instance, use OpenStreetMap tiles, but it's very generic in what it can accept and what it can use. Um, but I would love to see leaflet wrap. I think that would be a great demonstration and a great project, but, but not at the moment. Thank you very much.